Okay, cool. Are you a Okay, so we're going to... Yeah. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. This episode is a Gather Geeks special sponsor edition. Here's your host, BizBash CEO, David Adler. With over 163,000 employees and more than 5,000 properties, it's not easy to change the thinking of an entire organization. Today we are talking about what could be argued to be one of the two top event organizations on the planet, Hilton. Our guests today are on the front lines of successfully moving to a new approach for meetings and events that have been transforming the entire brand. Before we introduce our guests for today, let me tee up the discussion. The new Hilton event style mantra is local, purposeful, experiential, and flexible. Let's explain. We've heard all the statements many times that people are now increasingly choosing experiences over things more and more often. In fact, spending on live experiences and events has increased 70% in a generation. This year, the Center of Generational Kinetics for Expedia reported that 74% of Americans prioritize experiences over products and travel as a priority in life. Event organizers are demanding great, powerful experiences more than ever. Corporate meeting and event planners are leading the charge. The 30,000 square foot ballroom is the new town square that needs to be the center of a complete ecosystem and not just four walls and a chandelier. To talk about this changing phenomenon are two Hilton change agents who are typical of the new generation of Hilton's event and meeting teams. First up is Chef Philip Thompson, who has served presidents and dignitaries over his 10 years plus with Hilton and is currently the executive chef at the Hilton McLean Tyson's Corner, coincidentally in the shadow of the corporate office, and Lisa Rusi, Hilton's Senior Director of Catering and Events Sales Operations of the Americas. Her 30 years of experience with Hilton has allowed her to be in the forefront of the changes in the event industry, including winning last year's BizBash Event Style Award for Best Catering at an Event. We will also hear from Lauren Kotkin from Exponent Philanthropy, a Hilton customer who was recently recognized as a wow maker herself by working with Hilton to create special moments that illustrate this new generation of Hilton. Every day, Lisa, Chef Philip, and Lauren work on creating wow experiences that become the living embodiment of that famous Maya Angelou quote, that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So let's listen. So, Hilton, I think what people don't realize as a caterer is actually, if not the top caterer, within probably the top two catering companies in the entire global economy. In the world. In the world. In the world. Right. Because when we're doing events, we're doing events anywhere from 10,000 people down to 10 people, but it's happening in all of our properties across the globe and all of our various brands. And, And that experience is happening each day, every hour, from breakfast to lunch to breaks. And so no other catering or restaurant is going to have that volume that we have in our hotels. So number one key takeaway is the buying power of Hilton is enormous. Yes. And you should, if you're going to be a customer, you should really be aligned with them. Right. Because we can really then, you know, dictate sort of what we're looking for. And really what we're looking for is what the customer's looking for, right? Because right. we're listening to them. But that's changed a lot, right? It has. So, it has. So, Chef, how has that changed? How has the idea of Hilton as four walls in a hotel changed from Hilton as, as, a, as a part of a community? Because you're a big proponent of this. This is one of your things. Yeah, absolutely. We like to go out to the farms, go out to the purveyors and bring their stories and bring their experiences back to the hotels and kind of, you know, take away the four walls of the hotel and bring that experience right to our guests right here in the dining room, in the meeting space and kind of bring their meal periods to to life, so to speak. Yeah, but this didn't happen by accident. The idea is that you're a new type of person in the Hilton team that ha- that is bringing your personal experiences. Tell us about what what motivated you to sort of be that advocate inside this big corporation to make this massive change? 
Um, you know, I, I grew up in small restaurants and I, I worked with local purveyors, local farmers, and, um, you know, I really, listening to their experiences and listening to their stories, and I really wanted to be able to share that with our guests and really, you know, bring a little bit more intimacy to the dining room and a little bit more, close that gap between us and the guests, so to speak, and just kind of, you know, actually be out there with the guests, talking to them, listening to them, and kind of responding to that and listening to their needs. But take us back to you as a kid and mm -hmm. why you ended up being so passionate about this. Yeah. You told us about your stories. It's fascinating, dear, because everyone has those stories. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, I was very fortunate. My father and my grandfather were really keen, avid gardeners, and everything all that we ate all year round was pretty much grown out right out of our garden. And watching my dad and my grandfather pull vegetables out of the garden and bring them up to the kitchen, and my grandmother would, you know, passionately cook these wonderful dishes. And I just remember as a kid, you know, my favorite times were when we got to go visit my grandparents and I'd have to, my grandmother's cooking and watching her passion for cooking these really great, fresh vegetables right out of the garden just inspired. what was that flavor that that you first that first let you remember that, that one, of, one of my one of my favorite things and everybody asked me what my favorite thing I ever eaten was and I was probably about eight years old and I took a little cherry tomato right off the vine in my dad's greenhouse and it was one of the sweetest things I've ever eaten in my life and I just I remember that flavor even now all these years later how sweet and how juicy it was and it was just it was such an amazing freshness has that impacted your design when you help with customers today like, are you a tomato person, like, all the all throughout? No, that's <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you can take that freshness and bring it right to the table, you know, it's cutting down on that time and, and sourcing locally and, and getting the freshest product you can all year round. It enhances the flavor of the dish just phenomenally. It's, it's just such a better product to our guests. Great. And Lisa, you actually have a story about why you're so passionate about this and why you're inside this big company being this advocate. Because you, uh, you told me earlier your background, yes. and I think you should share that with our listening audience. Well, you know, I have a very diverse cultural background, which, you know, when you talk about the melting pot uh, in, in the Americas, I think uh, I'm definitely an experience of that, that I have Puerto Rican. Oh, tell us, tell us the... the dad the, is Puerto Rican, Italian, mom is German and African American. And so I grew up around a very vivid family when it came to food and parties and celebrations. And, and that just was part of the culture of what told the story of, of who they were. And I didn't know because that was just the norm for me. I thought a normal holiday dinner had all this variety of different cuisines and traditions and simple parties turned into these amazing things and also had this cross-cultural story connection. That to me is so important because when you talk about experiences, that's what's coming to life now is that people's experiences of whether their childhood, as Philip just talked about, or travel, or just researching and seeing things. So go back, go yes. back to your family. Yes. I, I thought that that was a great story <laughs> of, of what it was like to be you at what, 10 years old? Yeah, 10 old? years old. And how, and you obviously are a good manager because- I'm, I'm a good, <laughs> because I, people listen to You're me at the top level of the help. My mother very clearly. <laughs> Uh, let's have you know, at a very young age. So there was a uh, two celebrations coming up. It was a quinceanera for uh, one of our my many cousins that I have in the family, as well as it was a, a holiday they were celebrating from Germany. They happened to sort of coincide. And so they wanted to have a party because, of course, you're going to have a party to celebrate both of those things. But it was going to be the same party. And I decided, you know, I was going to be the the event planner for that at, at 10, 10 years, years old. old. Yes. Let's like and, that. <laughs> but, but we're putting quotes around the 10 years exactly. old. <laughs> and take charge of the decor, which decor in that days was, you know, some streamers and balloons and things. But I was very mindful, I remember, of trying to be, to honor both the Spanish tradition as well, the Puerto Rican tradition as well as the German tradition, whether it was through the look of it or the food. I remember talking to the various people who were cooking of what they were cooking and, and making sure it had that balance of sort of celebrating both of those cultures. And I think that was always very even at that age, I knew this was something that, something simple of just gathering people and these events was something that I enjoyed doing. And then it just sort of led to seeing that Hilton as Hotel Company, I think, you know, I went to an event after that that had a large group of people. And I said, oh, it sort of you came do, together. That, that was that, at 11? That was probably at <laughs> 11. My dad was in politics, so I was, I was very well traveled uh, on the circuit in the ballroom. So I got to experience that. And do you think that those experiences have impact the way you think the transformation of Hilton has, has occurred over yes. the last 
I don't know, it was a decade or two yes. decades. It, what what about it that that you bring to the table that that bring back that you know home table right. feeling? It's about personal, and I and I like that word of sort of creating that personal emotional connection, and and it's less about. I like the word customization, but I feel it's a little too corporate of a word. And I think before um, Hilton looked at how to customize, but it's really about how to create a personal connection. And how you do that is by understanding the uniqueness of everybody and understanding that the people you're bringing together each have a unique perspective. And when you're creating an event, how do you bring in the local community? Because that hotel is in a community. So that's also sort of part of the story. And then the story is also the attendees who have their own stories. And then there's you know, also what the reason they're coming together that it has a purpose and sort of taking those three components and weaving the food and beverage story through that. So it was really looking at it very differently. Well, we, we talked about the word experience, mm -hmm. but you were doing experiences at 10 years old. Yes. We just didn't call it that. Right. That's just how it was. But was there, was there a period in the corporate culture that we did not um, think of it that way, that, that this is an evolutionary thing that, that now... You're heal dealing with the first and second largest uh, catering company in the world, and they can do anything that they want because you have gazillions of events that you can learn from every single day. I think that uh, the hotels in general, and Hilton definitely being one of them, looked at, realized we had people coming into our hotels for events, but we it was much more of a... Uh, very structured. They're coming in. Let's make sure they have good meals and, you know, the rooms are set correctly and it looks pretty or it's it's nice or it's, you know, very business and professional. It was a very sort of structured way of looking at how we were holding events in our hotels. And then all of a sudden, especially with this next generation, right, that started to come in about, especially on the, the tech companies were sort of the first ones. Yeah, tell us about this. You've, you're from San Francisco. Yes. So you, I remember dealing with companies from San Francisco, and when they're doing their events, they're so concerned about the coffee and the style yes. of the coffee, where on the East Coast, we didn't have that problem for a long time, now right. we do. Right. Tell us about the customer changing and how that's changed you guys. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the tech customer came into San Francisco and they really were the first ones, instead of sitting down and talking about how they want to set a room or, you know, how many even guest rooms they needed. The first thing they wanted to talk about is one, um, let's talk about your food and beverage. Like, where's your chef from? Uh, you know, what restaurants, you know, are in the area that you feel have influenced what you're doing? What coffee do you have? All these things. And also like, instead of saying, this is how we want to set. This is our message we want to deliver. How can we be creative? Because so were you sort of our, like, like, oh my God? Right, yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I remember I, Google was the first one. Google back before, I remember I was meeting with, I think, employee number uh, 92, who is the admin assistant to the SVP of marketing, and she was planning their conferences at the time. Now she's a gazillionaire. Yes, very smart. <laughs> and I remember her um, explaining and sitting down with us and talking more about what they were trying, what was the message, what was the feeling they want to have. It was very much about feeling. So we're already to Maya Angelou. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, what? because they had created that environment in their campus, right? Because Google was one you of the first. You do that. Right. And they wanted to make sure if they were coming into a hotel environment that we were recreating that experience in our hotels. And, and so that's right away changed it from talking about very black and white structural things to very conceptual. So it's interesting though that the talent, we talked about the talent at Hilton is the highest level of talent in the world probably, but they weren't activated properly at that point. So chef, tell us about, like you are a lot different than a chef from a local catering company or a local restaurant. The training that's involved in to get the job that you have at Hilton is a major, major deal. Talk about your experience and how, how your training and the training of your colleagues so that they know what people are dealing with when they come to a place like this. Yeah, I, I went to culinary school uh, in England for about uh, two and a half years. Um, and I've been, I worked in restaurants for 10 years and I've worked for Hilton Hotels for 12 years um, and 20, 22 years in the job. And I still learn things every day. You learn new things. Uh, we're constantly trying to continue that education. You know, what can we learn to enhance our techniques, learn different things? Um, you know, what's 
what's the latest trends? What are people looking for? How can we learn more about that? So it's a constant evolution of education for the chef. And But the chef itself coming in at a high level, I mean, all mm -hmm. the, tr and the salespeople and the people that are dealing with it. So it's not, so sometimes hotels get a bad rap, but the training that is given because you can afford to do it right mm -hmm. is really exceptional. I mean, the, the chefs, your colleagues in the in this area that we're in right now have got to be of enormous talent. Yeah, absolutely. And the bar's always, you know, the bar's always raised every year. So we have to get better and better at what we do. And you're constantly trying to outdo the competition and think outside of the box. And what can we do to make it, you know, an even better experience? What can we do? Every single event, I think we sit down afterwards and say, okay, how can we make this even better? How can we do it differently? And how can we raise the standard? Right. So let's go a little bit into why we, how you've institutionalized this, uh, this farm to table concept. Mm -hmm which is much harder to do in a big institution like like Hilton. How do you do it? How do you take this huge corporation and make it so you're going to the farm in the neighborhood or in the in the area and actually bringing food directly there? Or, or how, tell us the sort of the, the ethos of Hilton and how it's changed and what you do. Well, give us an example. We're here in McLean, Virginia. You know the local purveyors. Yep, I, I think one of my uh, one of my favorite moments a few years ago was when I went to a local uh, uh, produce company and I told them that I wanted some product for an event. And I think it was about six seven hundred people, and they looked at me and their eyes kind of fell out of their head because they were like, "Well, there's no way we can produce that kind of stuff for you." So you know, I, I started to work a little bit more when I developed menus to work actually with my local purveyors when I'm writing menus to kind of say, "Well, okay, you know, how much of this can you get for me, and, and how, can you grow this for me?" So we'll actually work very closely with our supplier. And the great thing about a company like Hilton is we have huge buying power. So we can really work with a lot of regional purveyors and kind of source out the products that we want so that we can all get the product when we need it. So another takeaway for somebody who wants to be a customer of Hilton is you can probably get anything you want. Any idea you have, it could be done. And it's not just on the on the on the list of the of, of what you can serve in general, but you can ask for anything pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we try to stick through the seasons throughout the year. So we try to buy, you know, berries in the summer um, and squashes in the fall. But for the most part, you know, if somebody wants a really obscure ingredient, there's pretty much nothing that I've not been able to get for a guest. So what is Educate us on why it's so important to have farm to table. I mean, what is the, the you talked about the tomato flavor mm -hmm. from your kid, I mean, being a kid. Is it just tastes that much better? Yeah, I mean, we, we grow fresh basil right here in hydroponic uh, units that we have in the front of our restaurant, and the flavor that comes out of it is it's just phenomenal. And we can pick it, and half an hour later, we're serving it to our guests. The freshness just adds so much to the quality of it. Um, we get to support our local farms, we get to support the local economy, and it cuts down our carbon footprint in the long term as well. You know, we're not hauling produce thousands of miles across the country, we're bringing it 30 miles away right to our guest table. So it really helps the environment and it helps the local economy. And Lisa, talk about from the point of view of the people that are your customers, what is so important about farm to table? Why you talked about how the tech companies are doing that, but now everyone is, and they actually do care. Yeah, everybody is doing that, and I think it's about being, um, you know, good citizens. I think you know many company cultures now have a component about ensuring that the footprint that they're leaving environmentally supporting communities is very much a core to any company or association now. And so the expectations when they're coming to a hotel that we're giving them solutions on how to do that. And that's the other great thing that Hilton's, we can provide solutions because we're constantly having to push that because of we have so many customers that we have to keep looking, as Philip said, on new ideas. So if you come to us, we can sort of give you the solution toolbox already ready made, makes you look like the hero to your boss, um, because we basically, that's what we're doing, is we can then go to scale to our sponsors or to our partners and say, we want to do this, but you know we need to be able to do it for 800,000 people. Work with us on how you do that. And I think customers want it because it's, one, the right thing to do. Two, their companies are expecting it. And three, it is about the experience. The attendee, honestly, is looking for that connection to happen. They want to feel that they're a part of that community, even if it's for one event. So if a planner comes to you and has this off-the-wall idea, you guys are saying yes as opposed to uh-uh. We love it. So so yeah. that's a big difference yes. from the days of your. Yes. You know, that you say yes to almost everything. We love it. It's exciting. I think for our culinary teams, for our events teams, we are always excited because it is a, such a very different discussion. If you're telling me, you know, our message that we want to 
talk about in our conference is about you know bringing in the community or about military veterans things like that we can be like okay well we can create a food and beverage experience that we just did a few weeks ago where we have this um you know uh, socks for troops program and we made it into a break and that was really tell us that tell us yeah about that. so that's that was part of meet with purpose which is sort of the umbrella explain of, what meet with purpose is so so because you guys are now living this as part of yes. your culture yes and sometimes people don't realize that meet with purpose those are important words. Correct, correct. And it really, Meet With Purpose started is under sort of the umbrella of Travel With Purpose, which is really when Hilton looked back, and it was really about, you know, we were founded by Conrad Hilton. It was about hospitality. And what do we provide? And it was a light and warmth of hospitality. And when we looked at that and looked at our key pillars in our company, one of the things was being good corporate citizens and understanding that when people meet in our hotels, that... They want to feel a sense of purpose. They want they're there for a reason. They're meeting live for a reason versus over a phone or over a conference call. And so the travel with purpose was sort of the umbrella of when you're staying in our hotels. And then meet with purpose was about when you're meeting there. And it really talked about um, looking at ways to one, make sure there's healthy options when people are traveling for conferences. And unfortunately, hotels had very bad rap of hotel food, and you know, I'm gonna gain five pounds at that conference because I can't eat you know, healthy. So we want to look at that component. Um, and then we also want to look at being fit. And that also, you know, that provides that energy level you need for events. And so we looked at that component and then the give back to the community. So sort of three components of like, how do you, how do you, eating when you're you're at these events how are you exercising or maintaining meditation and things like that and then how are you giving back and connecting with the community so why don't you go through there's a couple of programs that that have kind of scaled yes right which it makes it easier for a planner to just do right and talk about a couple of those the the, the pets and right the, yeah so the first sort of two out of the gate oh, oh it's almost been now two years was first was yoga and yogurt so, and explain what take us into what that is so, we're kind of on radio right. so you gotta like <laughs> I can visualize. Yeah. Uh, I, if you picture Lisa, she's talking with her I'm hands very, a lot. Yeah, you uh, can see my cultural influences yeah. are very much being used. Uh, so yoga and yogurt is essentially, you can use it either for a morning or a, a break. And essentially you have, uh, the menu is composed of a variety of yogurts. And we do things like uh, avocado yogurt or coconut yogurt. A lot of sort of those very um, health forward, but in a unique way with different toppings and some pre-made. And the idea is that you have a yoga teacher um, set up, and this can be done, whether you could even have it in the corner of the general session, that break as you go over there and do some stretches, uh, full suit on that are more standing poses. And then guests, you know, are sort of brought through meditation as well. And then they go grab, you know, yogurt afterwards. So it's a combination. There's, we've done actually some uh, where you've got the virtual reality. We did that once for a group where they actually had the virtual reality yoga of the yoga and yogurt. And it was really about changing the whole dynamic of what a typical either breakfast or a break is and in a way that really put people in a very mindful place. And that got great feedback from customers. And that's being done all over the that's world being now? Done, yeah, in different I versions mean, you th in the, all when you do, over. When you create a scalable idea, does it does it travel well? It does. I think you have... It won't be... If you can't travel it... Right, it and that's key sense. for Hilton, right? Yeah. We can't... We want to make sure if we are you know, focusing on something that one, it's going to be cross-functional for our clients and their needs as well as our hotels. Cause it could, this might need to be put together for 500 people, but it might need to be put together for 10 people. And so yoga and yogurt was very simplistic and same with the um, puppies and ice cream. Okay. Which talk now... about puppies and ice cream. It sounds, um, trivial <laughs> and sort of like, but it is so important that it even is. the G8 countries are using this concept for leaders around the world. Yes. And I've seen it at the G8s and the G20s. And, and you're seeing this at some of the highest end conferences yes. where there's a there's an emotion that comes out of that. Talk, talk about is, that. There is, there is. And what is it? What actually so, is it? So puppies and ice cream or pups and pops, we also, you know, sort of the, the fun, playful version of it, is that you work with um, a local shelter uh, that has, and there's a we found very easily, these are in all the communities, who will bring in puppies either for adoption, and again, you can scale this anyway, um, if you have a local group that it could be for adoption, or it's just uh, animals who are at the shelter 
to be adopted, but need some interaction. You know, they're volunteers normally that can go to those shelters, but they actually bring the puppies to the hotel and you do a donation on behalf of the yeah, client. It's not an expensive thing. They don't, they bring them in own. and they, and basically, and, and it can, you know, we say puppies, but it could be older dogs too that are in there in the mix. And so during this break, then we also have popsicles, ice cream, popcorn. We just did it um, where we just did, you know, popsicles and popcorn to sort of make it a pop and pop. Uh, we actually did a, a ice uh, fire hydrant that the puppies were able to lick off. So it's an ice carving that there was actually a fire hydrant That's that the so puppies were, were licking off. And the attendees come out. And they play with the puppies. They grab some ice cream or popsicle and popcorn, and it completely changes the energy in the room. I mean, it, it doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter male, female. It does not matter. They did this at the G8 and they gave, in, in, in Australia where they gave all of the heads of state kangaroos to hold. Uh, and not only does it get everyone to smile, but it does change. It does. You remember that feeling? Right. You know, we're back to the Maya Angelou. Right. You know, no one remembers what you said, but they'll remember how you felt, right. how you made them feel. Uh, so it definitely. What what are another one that? What's another one? That, so the one that I was mentioning we just launched was um, treats for troops. So this was um, about um, giving. Hilton is very focused on our military and our veterans as well as our current military, and so we wanted something to focus along that. And that's come up a lot from our customers too, who are asking for that was important in their company um, to focus on. So what we did is we have a break patriotic red white and blue with and there's tons of varieties of what you can do to be playful with that and you come out and there's socks because we had done a survey of what is the most requested item of our military that they want shipped to them of like care boxes and socks was the number one item wow so people are giving back at their yes, meetings exactly so they come out and they you get to pick a pair of fun socks for yourself and then there's another pair of socks that you basically write a little note to thank our military members for their service you sign them real quick you grab your little red white and blue snack and then it's shipped off um, and you get to basically pick which of the military that you're going to work with and, and focus on are, is there any difference between the types of audiences for these types of breaks? Or are you finding people are people? People are people. And I think that's the main connector. And that's what changed hotels is that hotels looked at, were you corporate? Were you association? The reality is people are meeting live to have some type of connection. There's a reason they want to personally connect. And anything you can do from a food and beverage experience or any experience, it doesn't matter if it's a, a 100 CEOs or if it's a hundred school teachers, that that feeling is still there. Right, and also, I mean, I'm a big believer in this concept called social physics, how mm -hmm. ideas flow, mm -hmm. and that decor and all the things that you do are ways to get people to talk to each other. Yes, and that, I mean, who wouldn't want to talk about that cute puppy, right, or that military situation or whatever? But the idea is that we used to think that the hallways were a waste of time and trivial, and now what was trivial is now more important than ever. Right. Did you do the research to figure that out, or is it something that that? Again, I think we just started to see the, you know, I, you know, I know San Francisco was sort of one of the first in our company. Again, I think we were in that environment, that very incubator environment of the tech world that if it opened up everything to say, let's look at any ideas. And to your point, the hallways, right? What, what messaging can you do? What something fun? Can you put some, something for them to touch on the wall in between their meetings? All those started things that we started to look at very, very differently. Because again, they're in our properties. They're not just sitting in a room all day. There's this interaction that's happening, this energy that's being built. And where is this laboratory happening now? I mean, where are the ones that don't work? Like, how do you know that <laughs> bombs? <laughs> because, you know, we're not, it's all not going to be perfect. But you're testing things, you know, things that... that... I, think, I think, you know, it's interesting. I think one of the things I don't know if it necessarily bombed. I think it um, was a Oh, challenge. the real truth. Okay, and come I'll on. let Chef talk to it because <laughs> okay, I'm Chef. sure he lived through it. The, uh oh. The, the, <laughs> when you say you lived through it, <laughs> that is not a good sign. <laughs> the super tiny small plates for events. Like, we're talking like, you know. Okay, Chef, one this is your up. One teaspoon here, one <laughs> teaspoon here. Let's hear the, the, the failures so we learn, we learn more from the failures, right? You, you do learn from your failures, and I think that's the most important li lesson in life is you have to learn from your failures. And but you have to try stuff. You have to try stuff, and I think, you know, watching people wander around trying to juggle six or seven different small plates at a reception is uh, not a fun experience. Uh, so that was definitely a learning curve for us, but like Lisa said, What did you do? What was the, what was the, the program? Um, the, 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 the program was, you know, uh, a kind 
kind of, you know, tapa style or, you know, small plates concept in a reception where you could go around to multiple stations and try different things. And I think you ended up almost juggling too many different things. Um, and it was too many small plates. So it was kind of, you know, to dial it back and think, rethink outside of the box. Okay, how can we take this idea that we really like and make it work? Um, so we kind of mix it up a little bit um, and change the concept a little bit. But uh, yeah, it was not a... Uh, so when successful. you think about experiences... Mm -hmm. Uh, and overstimulation mm -hmm. is there sort of a fine line between too much and too little i mean how do you how do you you know if someone said that simplicity is the hardest thing to do i'm sure that steve jobs said that or someone else said that really how do you keep it simple and effective I think sometimes, you know, the simple things are the really effective things. And, you know, to go back to the story about the tomato is a tomato, when it's fresh and it's really served really simple, is really good. And I think sometimes we can overthink things and we just have to, you know, peel back the layers a little bit and just present things very simply. But we also have to kind of change the dynamic a little bit. And, you know, a tomato is a tomato back can we change it so that it gives people an unexpected flavor or an unexpected taste or an unexpected texture and kind of, you know, think outside the box, give people a little curveball, but still kind of serve it to them in a simple way. Is it mystery? What are the, what are the triggers of, of being different? I mean, when you're a chef and when you're, I mean, experience being an ex, a chef and creating experiences are the same thing now, right? You're sort of entertaining your taste buds as well as your, as yeah. well as the people with their eyes. And I think you want to play on the senses a little bit. And I think there's nothing, you know, for me, the fun when I eat is trying something that I'm expecting to be maybe a little sweet, but it's actually got a little saltiness to it or something that's going to be soft, but hey, now we've made it into a crispy kind of texture. And kind of playing on those senses, adding a little bit of mystery and just kind of, you know, changing the way people think about food a little bit. Is that what people want when they go out to an event? Do they want... Do they want that like traditional steak dinner or do they really want to have to be sort of entertained uh, with their with their taste buds? I, mean, I think for the most part, people want to be entertained. I think, you know, as, as Lisa said, it's, it's getting to know your clients and understanding what their needs and wants are. I think as a general th rule, I think that people want to be entertained. They want to have something a little different. They want to have an experience that they haven't had somewhere else or that they can't get at home. And, you know, at a hotel, we're perfectly positioned to be able to give them that to them. Yes, yes. So, Lisa, let's talk a little bit about the client who is brainstorming. How do you guys now... Get the new Google guy coming in or the new whatever the latest new tech company or the latest new bank that now is so into like making sure the coffee is perfect. Mm -hmm. How, what is the process now? It's, it's not just giving them menus anymore and letting no. them choose. No. What is the new ethos in terms of creating experiences with a team of people? Right. It's really about it. It, it starts at the very beginning. Right. And the first, you know, dialogue is we, we bring in our chefs right away from the beginning. That's, you start with the chefs. We start with the chefs. Okay. And they're in the room with the catering events folks, as well as usually you're talking, you know, the, the customer, they might have a marketing department. A lot of times we're seeing that now that they're involved in that, that conversation. The, is there an event designer usually? In yeah. The, and in there's the an event. Yeah. Because I would assume that the big buzzword is strategy. Yes, absolutely. And what, yeah, what is the strategy? Why are we, you know, ROI? What do, what, what do we want people to do? Right. So they should have basically that conversation is usually starting now with, you know, what is, one, why are we bringing people together? You know, what's the purpose? What is there something changing in our company environment that we're trying to focus on? You know, what there's almost also a lot of conversation of what hasn't worked well or what they've seen at other conferences because people are very much. Um, I'm seeing nowadays planners going to other conferences outside their fields just to see what they're doing differently. So usually that first con conversation is, okay, we want to focus on this. This is the purpose we're bringing. At the end, we want them to, you know, to have this as a takeaway or feel this or remember this. And, you know, the, the mix up of this is this age range approximately. And they also go to these conferences. And so then it's with our chefs of, okay, how do we take, because we picked a city for a reason, take that flavor and, and focus. Which is exactly in our conversation right. today with, with Lauren, she was talking about how she used, she's using the farm-to-table concept for entertainment, mm -hmm. that they're actually going outside the four walls, getting unique entertainment that you wouldn't see anywhere else, not necessarily the big names, and bringing them in. So we're going right. to listen to that for a second. So you've been recognized by Hilton... Uh, for a special award. And talk about why you won that award and how did it fit into your strategy? Yes, yeah, so the, the award was actually for something we did at a conference uh, a few years ago. Um, and it's 
let me talk about the strategy first. Um, so in every location that we have our conference, we have a local host community. And the idea behind having a host committee is to infuse the, the what's happening in that community in your conference, whether it's through the topics, uh, a conference topics, it could be through people, but also through the arts. And so something that's important to us is infusing the local culture into the conference so that when we are at um, you know, the Hilton Washington, it you know you're in Washington. You know you're in Washington because, well, this, that, particular hotel is an iconic, well-known for a particular event that happened a That's number of years sure. ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also to bring bring the outside in. And so when we had the conference in Washington, um, I actually stopped musicians that I would see at the Metro all the time, get their card. We brought some of those folks in to perform at the conference. Um, we brought in, uh, there's a, a violinist for the National Symphony who I saw at a street fair in DC, actually the DC State Fair, who turned a baseball bat into a, an electric fiddle. And he plays that, and we brought that to the conference. And then the particular uh, experience that we did at the conference for which I won this award was a commissioned poem, the DC Youth Slam Team, uh, with an organization called Split This Rock, uh, is an award-winning team, and we commissioned them to write a poem, uh, a spoken word, that would speak to what exponent philanthropy is in terms of giving, philanthropy, helping your community. Um, one of our committees, a committee of the board, came up with a list of words, and that we sent them to the students. These are all high school students, and they wrote a poem um, and performed it. So and, why don't we stop and yeah. play that poem, okay. and we will then come back and comment on it. Okay. Within the back of your throat, there's an activist waiting to be let out waiting to be given a chance to be ruthless and free, to be powerful and inspiring, to be loud and unapologetic. There's an activist tugging on your heartstrings right now, raging with change. To build a house, you must first build a strong foundation. A country's foundation is its people, and lately our house has been crumbling. Poverty ruins generations of families. It makes depression an unfortunate hand-me-down. There are children who have nothing to look forward to but the lives of their parents. It seems like we talk on the catering side of farm-to-table and things like that. What you've done is you've done farm-to-table entertainment. Exactly, exactly. And we, these students, there was everybody stood up and clapped at the end. Um, they got a standing ovation. They're young. I mean, these are 15-year-olds standing in front of 1,000 people. There are three or four of them. They've practiced this poem. Um, it, it really resonated with people with regards to tone, message, impact, their words. Um, it was a very powerful way to open the conference. So do you believe that it's now entertainment and experience has to be more purpose-driven to really work? As opposed to the way to just bring in a, a, an XYZ band or an orchestra or, a, or, an, or, or an activation, as they say. Yeah, I think unique experiences bubble up from two places. One, from the community where the event is being held. And then two, from the organization's constituents. So something like the DC Youth Slam Team, that came from the place. And we can now discuss, like, that's the kind of thing that you're seeing. So you're right. working with your, your customers. Right, and so we're helping them to tell us. They, they pick these cities for a reason or locations and so what we should be doing first because our menus and our, our chefs in these markets should be able to say well you know you're talking about you know it's um, you know you want to do something about sort of it's a campfire right you want them to have that sort of warm cozy feeling well you know in San Francisco it's very popular right now is um, you know doing some type of a you know bourbon you know a, a bourbon with a, a pear tasting so maybe that we create a campfire where we're roasting some marshmallows in the space, and we have a bourbon tasting next to that. And different things that we can do to sort of create that environment that allows for that basically purpose to recreate itself. So these ideas are great. And I hear that you guys are doing a lot of work in letting your teams experiencing this yourself. So yes. what do you do in the sales side to get people to be a fountain of ideas? Of course, besides watching Biz Bash and things right. like that. <laughs> of course. But, and what, Chef, what do you guys do to, to actually take you out of the four walls? You want to start, Lisa? Sure. Yeah. I think that was one of the key things um, that we realized we needed to do for both on the catering event side, our food and beverage professionals, is get them out into the communities to understand their communities. 
what was and they there. Haven't been. They, and they you, hadn't been. They Quite hadn't honestly, been. historically in hotels, you were moving around hotel to hotel, yeah. and you got there and you worked very hard and a lot of hours, and you really didn't have time to explore. What we're saying now is, no, that is part of who you need to know about this hotel and be able to talk to our customer. You need to be the expert. You need to say, you know, I went to this farm. And so we started to take them out to, we went in San Francisco, we did a combination day where we went out to a goat farm in Half Moon Bay. And we were out with the goats in the mud and walking around and, you know, petting the goats. And I met these, you know, two incredible women, goat farmers who had left their city jobs. And now we're raising goats and had goat cheese. And there were products that we're using in our hotel and had this great, Story. That story is fantastic. For I'd, I'd want to listen to that. Right, yeah. exactly. And then we went to a local distiller who was distilling local gin, which again, local gin is a new trend that was coming on board. And through that whole thing, then they were able to, when they're talking to the customer, have that excitement because they had experienced it themselves. And it also made them want to explore more on their own. Right. And Chef, how do you then uh, do the same thing in your kitchens to the people that are to be innovative? Yeah, we uh, we love taking trips out to the field, uh, visiting the farms, visiting the fishermen. Um, I mean, Chesapeake Bay is such a beautiful area. I love going out to the crab picking house. I uh, went out to J.M. Clayton's crab picking house in Salisbury last year. It's the oldest crab picking house in the United States. Um, Tangier Island, a uh, great oyster farm out there. Um, then we can head up to Pennsylvania, see the mushroom farms, uh, all the way through uh, Northern Virginia, and Maryland. What's the, great what farms. is the ROI of that in terms of Job satisfaction, I think I'm answering this question, mm. in terms of job satisfaction and, and increased innovation and, and just helping the customer. Is it, you're seeing that as dramatic? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's, it's inspiration for me. It's inspiration for my team. We're able to get out there, talk to people, understand the products, and we can bring those stories back to our diners, back to our hotel guests, and also see new products, see new things, and, and bring those experiences back to the hotel. And the hotel, though, is no longer a hotel anymore. It's really what you're trying to do. I mean, you're trying to make this into an experience in itself. That's what the hotel uh, proprietors are doing in terms of every part of the new architecture of hotels, and you're doing this internally with events. It sounds like too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I lo I love you know market style concepts for for our events are great. We can really showcase a lot of local vendors, and it gives it that kind of farmers market feel. Um, I love visiting the local farmers market every week, uh, and it's great to be able to bring some of those ideas and inspirations back to our you know our meal periods in the hotel. So, as we sort of wrap up a little bit, I'll probably come up with a new question here and there. What of your experience here at Hilton, what events have blown your mind that you've either worked on or attended that you could say, that you talk about when you when you talk to a customer or whatever? Um, well, there's been some great ones being in Washington, uh, many presidential events, uh, great black tie dinners, things like that. Um, the ones that really stand out to me was, I did an event uh, a couple of years ago at the Capitol Hilton, and we did a DC marketplace where we created a indoor market in our ballroom, and each of the different food stations was centered around an area of DC. So we had a Chinatown station, a wharf station, um, and then we took different parts of the city that inspired us, Adams Morgan, we had Latin flavor, and we kind of worked with our local vendors to create really you know, organic, natural experiences in each of those areas. Uh, and I was really proud of that one. We even had signage that was based off of DC uh, signs, street signs. So it was a really great event. Uh, the guests were just blown away with it. International travelers, so it gave them a really unique feel of DC. Was that the powwow? Was that a, a powwow event? Uh, yeah, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, great. And Lisa, you are from the Center of Innovation uh, in San Francisco. Uh, is there anything that, that in your sort of have seen everything mind that stands out? Well, I think that, um, you know, what stands out to me is um, an event that actually was created in San Francisco with Michael Vaughn, our chef there. And then we sort of morphed into what we just did a few weeks ago. And it was about creating the stories and telling the stories of our chefs and because they that was something we realized right and it's like how do we tell a story how do we recreate like you're in somebody's dining room in a way that you're learning and you're growing about who they are and there's this very personal connection so basically recreating the kitchens in different areas that if you were in somebody who their influences and their culture was about their grandmother's kitchen stove right. and Well, in you Provence. tell your story. I, right. mean, I, I remember you now by that, right. that sort of that, uh, that right. and your tomatoes will never leave my mind. Chef. Right. 
<laughs> and those are the things. And so basically we were recreating those kitchens. So we actually had stoves in the dining space, had pictures hung of them with their families or of the cultural influences, and then had these tastes from there, from very basic ingredient tastes all the way up to the main dishes that you could go around. So you really felt that you were, you know, learning. And then they were there. They were hosting with you. They were telling you stories, right? Like as we're sitting here, you're just sitting and, and hearing these stories of like, what inspired you? Tell me about that story with your grandmother or, you know, um, when you were growing up and you, you know, thought you were going to have a cooking show, right? Chef Michael was there with us for that. You know, that per created this personal connection. And that to me was the most important thing. Yep. And especially that we sort of designed it that way. Our audience were food and beverage director chefs who are, talk about jaded. They left there and felt like, I really got to know those people in the room and connect with them. There was a personal connection there and there was a, a pride for those chefs as well. So I think like that was... That feel, that's the feeling. That's the feeling. I mean, that's one, one thing I love about podcasts is you're listening in on someone else's conversation. Right. So you may not have a huge audience, but the people that you do get are really listening. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it. So let's do the crystal ball. I mean, you've seen Hilton transform itself over the last decade whatever. Or, um, 100, about to celebrate 100 years. 100 years, but, the, year. but the decade of changing of, mm -hmm. of people like you in this company that have changed it, what, is the, what will the next 10 years look like? How do you even build on this experiential feeling we're talking about now? Well, it's going to obviously continue. You can tell whether it's, uh, you know, the millennials or, you know, the generations. That's, they are now, you know, really helping us to open up. I tell people, it's, it's not that we didn't want this, or, you know, I, I say, you know, I may not be a millennial in years, but I feel I am in spirit, because in experiencing, I think we all have that in us. It's just, that was not the environment that we sort of grew up in doing events. But now, it's sort of anything is possible. Um, and I think, but again, creating some type of personal connection yes. and not having it mass produced, because that becomes very fake. And, and I think that is something that's going to be a big change. The new customer which we've talked a little bit about. We're going to this dinner tonight for, at Pineapples and Pearls. Very excited. And everybody's excited about going. Uh, and that we're going to be with a 27-year-old who goes out to dinner all the time. Right. And that is the new customer mm -hmm. that is so concerned about these experiences that love them so much. That Are you seeing that everywhere? Yes. And, and they're willing to pay. And they're the, willing to pay. They're willing to do that and forego, like, they'll live with eight people in a house to be able to afford going to these, you know, amazing experienced restaurants. But it needs to be very unique. It needs to be very true. Uh, it can't be overdone done in a yeah, way. It's there's a, a bit, subtle right, thing there where is. I don't necessarily have the right, like, right. I, I'll be over the top and I won't get it. But these, these younger people, oh, you can't do that. No. But and you can do that. Right. It needs to be very genuine. Genuine. They, they, have, they have a genuine like, radar. We don't have a I genuine <laughs> radar. We're so full of it. So I think it's important for hotels because we are large. Well, you hotels know. Are, are now becoming, have to become millennial minded right. in order to survive. Right. And, and you so, guys are doing that. Yeah. And you have like. to do that from the from the moment they check in, and our events especially, when we're walking around the space, we need to be able to show our space and what we can provide on a personal level. It's not about the four walls. It's not about a door. It's not that we have the most meeting space. Quite honestly, nobody really nobody cares, cares about that. But they want to know what can you do to help me provide this experience for our attendees. So t I want to end with um, the idea of the, the event is about to start. The customer walks in the room. What is that like when all of a sudden you're unveiling what you're doing to the customer? What does it feel like? And what is that experience? Is that a part of the process of the experience now? Yeah, for me, it's that feeling of when the guest walks in and you just see their eyes light up and there's just this kind of wow when they walk in and, you know, we're cooking and there's smells in the room and there's noises in the room and the visual and it's just playing on the senses and the smells and, you know, it just really gets everybody excited. So when the moment they walk in that room, they're just, bam, there's excitement right away. And how about you, Lisa? I, I think there's a way. I think that's one of the moments that people uh, miss a lot is opening an event. There are so many really cool things you can do to create that connection. I think people just open doors a lot of times, right? So, that's so the that first impression that is first critical. Impression. So instead of just opening your doors just to sort of, you know, 
the norm. What about, you know, if you're trying to sort of have a nostalgic feel, but a warm, fuzzy feel, having, you know, a Frank Sinatra, um, you know, singer in the middle to spotlight it with that. And they come in and they hear that those sounds. And then around there is a supper club environment that's been set up for them. And as they're walking in, the servers also have, you know, are talking to them and telling about their favorite, you know, 1950s song. I love Sin Sinatra with this, right? Talking to the guests. Like, this is a whole new concept. Like, how about if when people walked in, our our team, you know, all of our servers are actually engaging with the guests. Welcome, welcome to, you know, we're so glad it's going to be so exciting. Oh, this is, you know, Rat Pack theme. You know, I grew up in the 50s so and I love that. you're saying break the fourth wall. Exactly. Bring that's, that. Is bring, that the future, you Exactly. Think? I think that's it. That's because it's creating that immediate connection between our teams and that guest. That's great. Great. Well, Obviously, there's no passion for working at Hilton, <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, after a few years, <laughs> yes, uh, and that you guys are probably as enthused as the day that you were testing your grandparents' tomatoes and planning your event at uh, 10 years old. You, probably, we have not changed at all. Not at all. <laughs> so, with that, thank you so much for participating today. Thank you, David. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. Gather on.